Good afternoon. It's the week of October 10th, 2022. I'm joined as always uh, by Mike Rary. Hey, Mike, how are you doing today? I'm good, Will. How are you? We're having a beautiful, beautiful day here in the Midwest. It's going to touch 70 today. I think this is the last of uh, the nice day. So uh, I got some pink on to celebrate. Cool. Cool. <laughs> Um, also, uh, going to celebrate an up week. Last week, it uh, it was an ugly week, intra week, but turned out if you just look at the week to start to finish, we we're up during the week. So if we could throw the first chart up and look at equity returns for the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, U.S. equities for the week, which is the same as the month to date period, which is the same as the quarter to date period, not a typo. We're just talking about the same time period. Um, the S&P 500 or U.S. large cap stocks up almost 1.7%. And Will, as you said earlier, it was uh, it was a very volatile week. Um, it was kind of a bad news is good news type of a week. And in first two days of the week, the S&P was up over 2.5% on that Monday and Tuesday. And it was really bad news. Um, you know, job openings declined pretty dramatically. And then we also had ISM services, PMI, particularly the prices paid come down, which typically that would be bad news. But because that means maybe uh, inflation is going to start cooling, that was actually good news for markets. And then the next three days of the week, um, the S&P was down about 4%, uh, having its worst day on Friday. And that was because, you know, it was, it was sort of a, a good news is bad news type of a situation where the, the jobs report that came in on Friday, it showed the unemployment rate went down. Um, it showed wage growth was still relatively high. And those things ultimately meant, uh, you know, inflation may stay higher for longer and the Fed might have to hike interest rates more than people expect. So, you know, same type of stuff we've been seeing pretty much all year. Yeah, the... Uh... Back half of the week was that the Fed pivot is there's no hope uh, based Elusive. on that data. So, so <laughs> hope is not a strategy for the Fed here. Um, yeah. And I guess the other interesting thing last week was uh, rates kept going up, and mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll put that into context with the pretty significant uptick in oil prices last week, also. But let's look at fixed income first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking at fixed income, the higher quality areas of the bond market, seeing negative returns for the week. Nominal treasury yields rose just slightly, um, but you see a positive return for tips, which means inflation protected bond yields came down. And the difference between those two are the inflation expectations or implied break even inflation rates. So, what that essentially means is, Will, as you said, um, inflation expectations went up a little bit. And a lot of that was because commodities were up significantly and oil prices rallied. Yeah, let's uh, let's move to that on the alt page, if we can, Audra, because it's quite a big move for the week here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the energy complex up over 10%. Um, natural gas was flat, so the only other things in the energy complex are oil and gasoline. Uh, um, and those were all up you know, over 10%. And the reason there was OPEC plus came out and agreed to production cuts of about 2 million barrels per day starting in November. Of course, the reality here is OPEC plus has been uh, not fulfilling their production quotas. They've, producing, they've been producing far less than targets basically since COVID. Mm -hmm. So even if they were to reduce their targets by 2 million barrels per day, that really doesn't have any impact on actual output. So it was more just the idea of it, the gesture uh, signaling to markets that, um, hey, it might be a while. Anytime we make progress here on commodity prices coming down, it seems like there are people in the world that don't like that and want to keep them elevated. So, Yeah. And just from, from our framework standpoint, we're still showing that uh, inflation is high and rising, although we feel like it's it's cresting, it's still showing uh, in the data that it's rising. So not yet quite the moment to start buying fixed income. But let's, um, let's talk about the uh, sort of the impact that those rate increases have had on mortgage rates, because we did see, um, I think mortgage rates eclipse 7% and the housing market continues to uh, deteriorate rapidly. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're we'll look here at um, mortgage rates in the blue line, and we've had to invert this axis here. So when you see that blue line heading straight down, that actually means mortgage rates are rising rapidly. And the re- the reason why we inverted that is because mortgage rates are a leading indicator of home prices. And so if they're going to lead home prices, that means higher mortgage rates, home prices coming down. So, um, but yeah, as you said, mortgage rates up over 7%. One of the most that, you know, mortgage rates have been 7% previously, but to rise this quickly um, is something that we haven't seen in, in quite some time. And now, as mortgage rates rise this much, it has the effect of locking out first-time home buyers um, and also preventing sales activity. Because if you're sitting in your house and you've built up equity and you have a three and a half percent thirty-year fixed-rate mortgage, there's very little, if any, incentive uh, for you to sell your home and then have to go and buy a home at a seven percent interest rate. Right. And so. You know, we've had seven consecutive months of declining existing home sales. And just now, we're seeing that purple line coming down. That's the month-over-month uh, change in the Case-Shiller National Average Home Price Index. Finally seeing a negative month-over-month print, our first decline in national housing prices since 2011. Yeah. Yeah, it begs the the question we're getting from clients is, are we going to see a housing market crash. I'll use the air quotes here. And maybe just uh, talk, talk about the uh, crash is a relative term, right? Um, but talk about what that might mean and what the trajectory of prices could look like before they sort of shallow out here. Yeah. So we would say the probability of a 2008 type crash is very, very low. And one of the necessities to get a swift downturn in housing prices is you need forced sellers. And so you think back to 08, why were people forced to sell their homes when they didn't want to into that negative environment, which really pushed down the price of houses on in aggregate? One of the big reasons was floating rate mortgages. Um, you know, structures where your mortgage rate was locked in for two years and then would be fixed over the next 28 or a diff- different adjustable rate mortgage type products. Those were far more prevalent than they are now. So this time around, there would be very little forced selling due to mortgage rates resetting higher here in the U.S. Um, one of the other necessities of forced sellings or, or things that we typically see when there's forced selling in the housing market is people losing their jobs rapidly, which is not something we have yet seen in this cycle. Um, we continue to see monthly non-farm payrolls gains and the unemployment rate is extremely low. So that doesn't really create forced selling. So it's tough to see right now how we would get the forced selling required to create a big downturn in housing prices. And this month over month obviously is alarming. But you put that in the context of the gains we've had. And basically, it takes the index back to May 2022 levels. Mm -hmm. And on a year-over-year basis, housing prices are still up 15%. So. Yeah, it's it, like I said, it's relative. If you bought last year at this time, the chances your price will continue to decline significantly is probably high. Um, but if you bought five years ago, 10 years ago, it's all relative, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So let's, uh, let's talk about the impact of housing on inflation because I, as I mentioned earlier, we should be sort of at the top here or putting it at the top here soon. Uh, what is the impact of housing prices on inflation and, and what has to happen for it to, to really start to impact inflation mm-hmm. more meaningfully? Sort of the series of leads, leading indicators. So mortgage rates lead home prices or the momentum in the housing market by six months. And then home prices lead CPI, uh, inflation, by about 12 months. And particularly, we're talking about the shelter component of CPI. So home prices aren't directly reflected in CPI. What you get is the shelter basket, which include, they, includes things like rent of primary residence, which we know if you're renting an apartment, you know what that's been doing recently, or um, owner's equivalent rent, which basically means you estimate if, if I right now were to rent my home with no furnishings, no utilities, what could I get in terms of rent, for example, if I own my home. Um, those are the things that go into shelter. And shelter 
is about 40% of core CPI. And you can look at the relationship here. You know, once again, the purple line is home prices with a 12 month lead on CPI shelter. And all this means this, this lack of, of momentum or this downturn in momentum of uh, home prices that we've seen here recently is this green line hopefully stops going up over the next 12 months and just goes sideways. But even if it just goes sideways, you're still talking about 12 months from now, a 5% roughly year over year increase in shelter. And that's 40% of the core CPI basket. So the Fed would view this and say, all right, we've done a lot here to push up mortgage rates. We've sort of stopped the bleeding here in terms of how the housing market impacts inflation, but we're just getting started. I mean, we need to get this purple line down probably somewhere near 5% on the left axis. And that would equate to shelter CPI running about 3%. And at least then we have a shot at meeting our 2, two to 3% inflation target. So really just start, just getting started. Yeah, and not more evidence that there's no Fed pivot coming potentially anytime soon. Um, so the, the impact of this on inflation, let's throw up our inflation forecast because of this plus the increase in oil prices, like are we going to see persistent sort of stagflation or are we going to see this start to roll over? Yeah. So um, based on our models, what we're looking at in the next 12 months is we've probably seen the peak in year over year headline CPI. So that's the dark blue line. You can see our forecast out the next 12 months. And the reason why it should start to come down is because, yes, although we saw gains in commodities last week, by and large, commodities are down from their sort of May highs, May, June highs. And that's going to have a negative impulse on headline CPI, which includes food and energy. Um, and other things within the, the headline CPI basket that are less sticky, things like used cars, for example, even new cars, we're seeing those prices come down. So, so that's good news. We think you know headline CPI is definitely high and falling over the next 12 months. But the core CPI is going to be a continue to be a pain point for the Fed. So a reminder, we're getting CPI numbers for September this Thursday. Um, and what they're likely to show is core CPI on a year-over-year -year basis went up again. And our estimate is in October, it's likely to go up again. And it's because of things like shelter, medical costs, things that are unavoidable. You know, if I want to avoid paying too much for a used car, I just won't buy a car. But I can't avoid, you know, not paying for shelter or medical costs. So that's going to be the pain point for the Fed. And that's going to take longer to come down. Probably not until, you know, spring next year is when it's really going to start coming down um, at a pretty fast rate. Right, right. So all the more reason to to sort of state the point that it's going to be very hard for the Fed to do anything except fight inflation for a while. Yep. Um, yep. Maybe just um, as we transition into liquidity, talk about you know the Fed uh, balance sheet runoff, what the status of that is, because it's, I guess, less than advertised uh, mm -hmm. as we've seen so far, and uh, what that does to liquidity. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so we throw up the liquidity forecast, you can see exactly what you were just talking about there, Will. So everybody who's been following this chart that we've been doing, you've seen in our forecast area, it's pretty, pretty much just been low and low. And we have recently revised some of the estimates in our model about the pace of the Fed's balance sheet runoff because they have been consistently underperforming the expectation. The idea is that at this point, they should be reducing the size of their balance sheet by $95 billion a month. And that's $60 billion worth of treasuries and $35 billion worth of mortgage-backed securities. But they've been doing less than half of that. And the reason is, if you're like the... And, and, and so as we adjust those forecasts, you see that light blue line actually starts to tick up a little bit, showing signs of life. Um, still not, nothing to get overly excited about. It's still very low, but some, some signs of life there. And so the reason why we had to revise those expectations is, if you're, if you're an institution like the Fed, you own a pool of mortgage-backed securities, and you're waiting for them to mature and roll off your balance sheet. Well, what you've been experiencing here, particularly over the last few months, is these things have not been maturing. You haven't been getting prepayments. 
And how do you get prepayments in a pool of mortgage-backed securities? People sell their home. So if they had a mortgage outstanding, it gets paid off and buy another home. People aren't selling. You know, seven consecutive months of existing home sales declining. Um, or people refinance their mortgages. They had a mortgage outstanding and they refi, and so it gets prepaid. And that, that security matures and it rolls off. People have not been refinancing. I mean, refinancing activity is down about 90% year over year. And a logical question is, why isn't it down 100%? I mean, who is refinancing in this type of an environment? It's really only like cash out um, right. equity refinancing activity is really it. Um, and so, you know, now the question, it begs the question, are they actually going to sell securities? They haven't done this. You know, they let the securities mature and they roll off. But selling uh, implies a different level of, or bringing upon a different level of market instability or market risk, apparently. And this is something they said they haven't talked about yet. So we expect they're going to continue to underperform their target because of our outlook for what's going on in the housing market. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, in terms of liquidity and its impact on near-term uh, equity prices, I just talk about the relationship of that and the correlation we see between the two. Yeah, on sort of a real-time basis, if you look at something like net liquidity, which is Fed assets minus the Treasury General account minus reverse repo, and that number is sort of the true measure of money supply out there that can be used to buy assets and grow the economy, et cetera. You can look at that on a real-time basis. And it's led the S&P 500 with about a two-week lead um, since COVID. And so you know, liquidity is going to keep coming down. We're basically showing maybe it doesn't come down as quickly as we forecasted a month ago, but still going to be coming down and so that should continue to act as sort of a force of gravity, um, being a consistent headwind for equity prices. It's just going to be tough to tough to overcome. Yeah. Okay, let's shift gears, uh, throw up the um, growth chart here. One of the things I want to mention is, I think it was Atlanta, Atlanta Fed GDP now just came out 2.9% Q3 yeah. GDP. Uh, so... Give that context in terms of everything we've just said. How do they how do they show a almost three percent GDP print for the quarter? Yeah, well, it's actually um, quite a bit of statistical wonkiness, if you will. So, um, the Census Bureau put out advanced leading economic indicators for things that are very volatile to predict within the GDP basket, which are things like uh, net exports and inventories. And they were revised dramatically higher. So if you've been tracking the Q3 estimate, Atlanta Fed's Q3 estimate for GDP, it got as low as you know, 0.1, 0.2%, and then shot up once that data was released. So um, if we're, And we track that measure. That's a tremendous amount of statistical wonkiness there. But it, that's why we wanted to show this chart, because this does not change the consensus for this year or next year. Um, you know, low and falling growth expectations. So the dark blue line is consensus for 2022 real GDP growth is still zero. Uh, it was 0.1 last time we looked at it, but now it's, it's zero. And uh, you can see the light blue line shows how expectations for 2023 real GDP have come down. They're down below one for next year. And then the last thing you see is the economic surprise index. And the economic data was coming in way worse than expected, basically from May through mid-September. And now we see some signs of life. Um, but once again, this is relative to expectations. Pretty much the reason why this is green is because the expectations keep coming down. Mm -hmm. You know, Eventually, you right-size them, and they're easier to beat. And then two, uh, the labor market has just continued to defy expectations and, and come in a bit stronger than expected. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess transitioning to the idea of uh, recession, I think I saw a headline this morning, Jamie Dimon says, we'll be in recession in six months. So it must be true then. <laughs> he must <laughs> he must be uh, have his own recession indicator. But let's throw our recession forecast up and uh, see how that sort of parallels with what uh, Mr. Dimon said. Yeah, and so monitoring it in real time, we see you know, a little over 55% chance that the U.S. economy is in a National Bureau of Economic Research style recession um, over the next six to 12 months. Um, less than that right now, we think the strength of the labor market continues to confirm that the U.S. economy is not currently in recession. 
Uh, so you see about a 22% chance we're in one right now. And you know, one reason why that's still 22%, even though we got 260 some thousand jobs added last month, it's because the non-farm payrolls data is heavily revised um, subsequent to frequent revisions. So um, not too much changed from the last time we looked at it, just really some adjustment based on market moves here in the past week, um, still above 50%. All right. Uh, I know we have some questions in the queue. I can see them here. So, Audra, if you want to throw the first one up. Is it better to continue investing while prices are high and falling, or should I wait until prices are rising again? Okay. Yeah, better. Find better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, high and falling, if, just to sort of revisit our framework, um, each equity index and bond market index has four price regimes. The best for, for the stock market is low and rising. Uh, the second best is low and falling. And then the next best is high and rising. And then the worst is high and falling. So is it better to invest while prices are high and falling? Well, in our framework, it's not better. Um, it's the worst of the four. Um, you know, but once again, this is a matter of time horizon. If you're a very young long-term investor, you know, 40 year time horizons probably doesn't matter, but is it better or should you wait until prices are low and rising? Well, in our framework, we're going to wait until they're low and rising before we start going overweight, making significant investments in equities. Yeah, especially when you can get a 4% yield on a two year treasury. Right. I mean, it's, uh, it's nice to get paid to wait. So, all right, let's throw up the next question. If inflation is above 8%, why does it make sense to invest in bonds that return only 4%? I'll yeah. tell you what, whoever's writing the questions this week. Um, <laughs> uh, first things that come to mind would be 8% headline CPI is a trailing number. Right. It's over the past 12 months. Would it have made sense to own a 10-year bond over the last 12 months when inflation was running 8%? Obviously, no. no. Right? So the que it, this is more about expectations. The question is, does it make sense to buy a four-year bond now, given where inflation is headed, given what the price return potential is on that bond? And our framework suggests, suggests yes, it does. Because if you look at, say, the 10-year treasury yield, yes, the yield you get may be four, but there's potential for price appreciation. So that security has a duration of almost 10 years. So if interest rates at the 10-year point go down just 1%, you over the next 12 months, you would get your 4% yield plus about 10% price return. So you get 14. And you compare that to what inflation is likely to trend at over the next 12 months, and it will make sense. Right. Um, yeah. You know. yeah. So that's all, how we look at yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's completely logical. Uh, you have to look at it forward and a forward rate of change basis. And you have to sort of get your timing right, right? Because we've been sort of waiting on Godot here for the for the actual fixed income trade to start working. We don't, we're not quite there yet, but we feel like we're pretty darn close. And as soon as we're ready, we'll be pulling the trigger on those. Early is early is tough, but there's absolutely zero value in being late. Yeah. So you don't want to be late. I would rather rather be early. All right. Next question. Does liquidity go lower when people lose their jobs and are making less money? Well, for them it does. <laughs> a good good question. So yeah. When you talk when we say liquidity, we translate that into growth rate of the money supply. And what's actually very interesting is one of the fastest ways that money is created in the economy is through transfer payments from the government to private citizens. And that tends to happen when the unemployment rate rises because unemployment benefits, jobless benefits are transfer payments. Mm -hmm. So actually what you see is money supply growth usually starts to pick up once folks start losing their job because they start getting increased transfer payments. Um, so kind of works different than, than people might think, but yeah. If you think about it during, during the COVID um, response, the 
unemployment was extended and enhanced. So it, it went yeah. even further than standard. So it was sort of transfer payments on steroids. And we're still experiencing some of that, I think. All right, we have any other questions? Oh, yep. Is there a point where liquidity is low enough and falling fast enough that you don't want to own any financial assets? Interesting question. Well, okay. So when liquidity is scarce, you can make money by providing liquidity. And to provide liquidity, what does that mean? That means somebody's trying to sell something and they're willing to do it at a fire sale price because they need cash. And so the financial asset you want to own in order to provide that liquidity is cash. So when you say like own no financial assets, absolutely not. Um, you want to own high quality liquid assets that you could very easily exchange for the assets that other people are selling because they need money and you can get those things at a bargain. And that's why in this low and falling liquidity environment, all our client portfolios are overweight, high quality short-term bonds. I mean, those things are or cash, just cash, cash itself. Uh -huh. And that's about as good as it gets. Absolutely. Okay. I think there's one more question here in the queue. <sighs> Well, if we have it on screen. Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay. Markets have fallen a lot this year, clearly. Uh, would a recession push them lower or keep them at higher current levels or keep them at their current levels for longer? Mm. You know, this is another tough, tough question to answer. It, markets can always go lower. Right. And And normally what you see the pattern around recessions. If you just think about the timeline to go into recession and how equity prices evolve over time, about six to 12 months before the actual recession is declared, the market sends a warning shot. Um, and it usually sells off about 20%. Very rarely does the stock market go down 20% if people aren't worried about recession, right? It's usually in there. And then after that warning shot, everybody's sort of waiting to see the economy is dynamic. So can we recover? Are the fears overblown? Yada, yada. And then once we get to, all right, recession is inevitable. We see the unemployment rate rising. You know, We're less than three months out from when the recession is actually declared. That's usually when you have the next leg down in equity prices. So it is our base case view. It's built into our framework that if we were to go into a recession, that would imply that equities would probably go down more from here. Uh, it's very unlikely that they would just stay here. Yeah. I mean, if you look at all the, the data we've been sharing over the last several months, there's there's not a lot of improvement in the data until mid to late next year. So uh, strong probability that if we go into recession, we'll get a continued market reaction lower. Great. I think that's it for questions. Uh, appreciate the time today, Mike. Thanks. And uh, we'll be back next week for uh, a look at the week and uh, the inflation data. Mm -hmm.